I will be dealing, I will be discussing with you the um, a complementary you know, approach to biodiversity assessment. And for this part, what I'm going to discuss is uh, actually uh, a combination of uh, our very recent initiatives. Some of these are my students. Some of these are my co-faculty, including Professor Malabrigo. So we have started our small molecular biology laboratory in the College of Forestry. And hence, we are excited to really uh, um, maximize some of the facilities that we have in order to uh, um, uh, focus our uh, biodiversity assessment for our native trees. So I'll be highlighting, again I said, some of our studies on DNA barcoding, as well as genetic diversity and structure of three populations. Particularly, I will be giving you some examples, uh, results of what we conduct, what we did for our Philippine iron woods, and as well as the bitterocarps, our premium hardwood species, and even the sand. Uh, also value this as uh, one of the most ecologically important premium hardwoods. And then I'm going to uh, um, synthesize the presentation with how are we going to use this information for uh, taxonomic purpose as well as for the conservation of these native species. Um, we all know that uh, the Philippines, uh, Dr. Cardenas has already stated this earlier. So the Philippines, despite of its small land area, is a mega diversity country and at the same time a global hotspot okay, of biodiversity. And here may I just show you uh, for two, uh, two consecutive updates of the Philippine Red List for Plants. And uh, if you hear the latest in 2017, we could see the 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 threatened you know, the threatened the amount of threatened species, okay, of plant species has nearly doubled. In fact, those in the vulnerable stage, so more than uh, twice the number. You know? So uh, it, this is a sad reality, but we should consider this also as a challenge. So that's why with this particular. Uh, information. This prompted, this prompt us to really um, focus our attention on assessing how much are we losing from this, uh, this uh, from the loss of biodiversity. Earlier, Prof. Marabigo, um, uh gave a very good uh, but, uh, picture of a, a biodiversity occurring in a very small. Uh, portion of the Philippine Sea Islands. So here, in this particular uh, presentation, um, while there is a need, you know, while there is a need to assess biodiversity. So in fact, most of our existing records of biodiversity assessment, particularly for forestries, are at the top portions of the biological organization. Very limited could be found information on the genetic diversity of these forests. So my, I think one of uh, my goal is really to uh, focus on how much genetic variation is present in the biodiversity. Okay, so and in forests, uh, there is a very good opportunity because forests harbor a lot of genetic variation, and this. Well, uh, this is a very good um, a venue to um, guide or to provide recommendations on how are we going to uh, execute or implement our genetic conservation efforts. And of course, um, uh, we, we uh, for several decades we have used genetic technologies, and um, in the last uh, few years we have gone through we. Genomic, you know? some of the functional genes are being uh, discovered. Uh, those that are associated to particular traits of uh, our forestries. But I'll be just uh, 
discussing on genetic conservation. So in the past, several genetic or molecular markers have been used to assess diversity in tropical forestries. So mainly, uh, we have seen a lot of variability in tropical forests, but for endemic species, like the ones well, we found out in uh, Mount Iraya, for example. So most of the endemic species, as well as low-density species, on average, they have low variability. So uh, in tandem with, the, with those kind of uh, biodiversity assessment, so I think this uh, um, assessment using genetic markers is very important you know, in conjunction with those kinds of assessment of biodiversity. So for several decades, it has improved uh, molecular techniques to characterize biodiversity, not only at the species level, but at the population levels. So it has improved our understanding of how much genetic variation are present in forest trees. And in fact, uh, worldwide, it, this has changed our traditional conservation inferences and it, concern, it greatly influenced conservation efforts. Maybe in the Philippines, we, have not, uh, we are not yet uh, at that stage, just like in other countries. But I think a lot, there are already you know, some initiatives that uh, could really guide our conservation efforts. So while we're also talking barcoding, so I think this is very popular already. So even in plants, in animals, in microorganisms, I've seen a lot of papers for the DNA barcode. So normally the original, the original purpose of barcoding is for species discovery. But later, because using barcode or barcode, you know, using barcode, so conservation of the species is also the interest of, uh, from DNA barcodes, from information of DNA barcodes. So this is actually the pipeline of barcoding. You know, we we uh, collect samples or DNA from a specific plant, and then it will undergo, um, uh, we submit sequences from the barcode of life before we were, we will be given, uh, and then after that we will be given this particular barcode for a particular species. Okay, so let me give you some examples of our initiative. So this one is a, one of our colleagues, uh, so assisted by our laboratory. So the Theracarpus is one, as I've said, one of our premium hardwood uh, species groups also in other ASEAN nations. And in the Philippines, um, while there are established morphological differences, characterization among the many genera of these particular uh, groups of species, there are some confusions. There are some synonymity. You know? But here, so using this particular this phylogenetic trees based on the barcoding gene, the RBCL gene alone, Although there is one more, the MAT K, for land plants we have the mitochondrial gene. But here we were able to establish that yes, the five, almost the five genera of Deuterocarpus can be, you know, can be delimited. However, this particular species, for example, the Pentacmenidensis, so there was very similarity with Shorea contorta. Right, sir? Uh, there is some synonymity, but based on the barcode, but based on the sequences of the RBCL, the pentaclemidinesis is relatively different from the Shurea contorta. So we would like to send a message that with barcode, with this particular um, sequence, so Shurea contorta and pentaclemidinesis could be two distinct species. And then also, the pentacmen in the lenses, which is not really a, uh, um, <laughs> here, these are the five common uh, genera in the Philippines. So we, with this position of the pentacmen, the pentacmen genus ano, is also present in the Philippine Dipero arms. So this is what uh, we learned from, our, uh, from the previous study of one of our colleagues. Sorry. 
And then another one is this is one. This is a this was a result of my BS um, um, student. So Hopeya Class 40 and Hopeya Malibato. These are very many people. Even I think taxonomists. So even taxonomists are having confusion in delimiting delimiting these two species. So one is endemic, and you can we can only find this in these islands in Sibuyan. But Hopeya Malibato is endemic but widely distributed. Endemic in the Philippines, but widely distributed. And in terms of their uh, morphological character, especially leaves, so they are almost the same. But when we look at the uh, mitochondrial, uh, barcode uh, bar G, uh, the MAT-K gene, sorry, the MAT-K gene, so we were able to see that the Hopeya Pax 40 and Hopeya Malibato, they only differ in one single nucleotide, in only single nucleotide substitution. So this particular sequence, we also tried the RBCL, but we did not find any variation. But MAT-K was able to distinguish the two. So this particular sequence, at the 583, around 584, so one is a T and one is a C. So this particular barcode uh, gene sequence could be is very important. So when we submit this to the barcode of type, then uh, this will help us in identifying which is Hopeya Fox 40 and which is Malibato. So this is a very good, uh, I think this is an important finding regarding these two, uh, two species so that we can assist our, even our taxonomists, so we can assist taxonomists in really delineating these two particular enterocarps. And then um, we also have, actually we are, we still have more activities or initiatives on the Philippine iron woods. So the, the reason why they are called iron woods is for their durability. The wood is uh, really durable. And then two particular genera are considered uh, uh, iron woods, the Santos Camon. So these are thanks to Dr. from Malagrico for the pictures. And then the other one is under the Tristanopsis genus. And so these are considered Philippine iron woods. So this is one, an, an output from one of our uh, students. Okay. And then when we look at the sequences of Philippine iron woods, so in fact there are we were able to see that Tristanopsis and Santos Temon are really two distinct genera uh, of the Philippine iron woods. When we downloaded sequences from Australia, Indonesia, and other tropical countries with Tristanopsis and Santos Temon, our Santos Temon is indeed Santos Temon and our Tristanopsis are really from the Tristanopsis group. But there are some cases that uh, in the field it's very difficult to identify you know, some of the iron woods because of similarity in their uh, leaves. So uh, especially when flowers are not present, you know, it's very difficult to identify. So for example, we have collected some species in areas uh, according to the locals, it's Tristanopsis, but some said it's Santos Temon. But because only in, the, in, in that area, only one species is known to occur. So that's why this particular un unidentified species it has become problematic in terms of its identification. So we try to also sequence this and uh, these unknown individuals because um, and then we would like to see if the related, uh, how related these individuals from the Santos Temon and Tristanopsis. And we were, we were surprised that this Tristanopsis uh, uh, clustered with Santos Temon. You know? But when we downloaded some sequences, when we downloaded some sequences of Santos Temon and Tristanopsis you know, from the databases, we we were able to uh, to um, to locate that these Tristanopsis individuals are very are closely related in terms of sequences with the Tristanopsis in the Philippines. You know? 
So this one is just among the sequences that we have. But when we downloaded several sequences of Santa Spe monetary stenosis from databases, we confirmed that these individuals are trisclenopsis. Okay, but we are we will have uh, more initiative on this to really tell which particular species is this uh, unknown individuals. Okay. So and then uh, let me go back to the Diptero carbs. So in terms of population genetic structure, Mount Makili Forest Reserve uh, has very has limited number of Diptero carbs. But one of the dominant species is Parasurea malaganonan. If you may I go back to the initial slide. So here the location, the evolutionary history of Parasurea malaganonan. Okay. So, yeah. And then here, uh, one of our colleagues who conducted this study in Japan, so from the South Coast in Mount Makili, we were able to, when we um, uh, sampled adult sapling and seedlings, to really tell at which particular stage of the life cycle of a plant has uh, diminishing or increasing diversity. So we found out that um, there's a uh, significant reduction in diversity from adults to sapling and then to sibling, to sibling stages, although we could confirm that there is no inbreeding. Uh, you know the, uh, the genetic risk of inbreeding in natural populations. So we confirm that the Parasurea malalona in Mount Makili has uh, no inbreeding. Okay, so this is the, the collection site, and from here we analyzed uh, relatedness. So I think this is important in reforestation or restoration efforts. You know? So MMFR is the target for in situ. And then when we make a, an analysis of kinship or relatedness, so we, we could say that when we do collection of seeds and saplings for reforestation or for planting activities to avoid maternal hapsip and to, to avoid similarity of their parents so that we can avoid inbreeding, we at least maximize something every 100 meter. Uh, so that is based on this particular data. Okay? So. Then, then we look at the landscape level and we, we confirm that there is still Parasurea malalona maintains high level of genetic diversity. So this is the whole transect uh, uh, where Parasurea malalona were sampled. And then here, based on our uh, uh, analysis of the genotypes, okay, based on nuclear markers, so to maintain genetic diversity of P. malalona, so we should continuously conserve in situ, okay? And then for ex situ, so for ex situ at a landscape level, so we avoid 50 meters to, the collection of seed and samples should be avoided at uh, less than 50 meters. And then since uh, at a larger area, the minimum conservation area for Parasurea Malado and MFR range from 600 to 3,000 hectares. So that's the minimum. This means that there is a necessity to conserve the entire Mount Makili in order to protect or to avoid decreasing, decreasing diversity of Parasurea Malodona. These are based from all the nuclear markers. So what we can get from this particular uh, information, so again, accuracy, the bagit, this was mentioned by um, Dr. Cardenas earlier, accuracy in identification of biological organisms and knowledge on the amount of genetic diversity in its population are prerequisites of conservation, especially you know, the such cases when morphological traits among groups of species lack variation to delineate taxonomic boundaries. So I think uh, there could be you know, more uh, implications of this uh, kind of uh, molecular studies, but at, uh, initially this is the message that I want to uh, say to everyone that I think it's right time that 
the forestry sector, particularly in conservation of forestries, must also give attention to these small details because, as you have seen earlier, the biological organization, the base of the biological organization is the genes. Uh, genetic diversity is important so we, will, uh, so we could understand what is really happening, you know, or uh, uh, in terms of uh, diversity, for example, how can we interpret diversity at the species and ecosystem level when we are not really sure about you know, the amount or the structure of diversity at the base or at the genetic levels? Thank you very much.